access granted. Three months ahead of time pre-order, four delays, $180, two-year warranty, four rear buttons, five-way trigger stops. I can keep rattling numbers at you or I can run a sick little intro and then we can get into the most comprehensive in-depth review of this controller you're going to find not only on YouTube but probably on the planet. Let's get it. This is your controller, Captain. We've reached 6,900 feet. Go ahead and start flicking the sticks and molly in the back paddles. Mm, you don't like back paddles? How about those rear buttons? We've tested almost 100 custom and premium controllers, and we're only at the beginning. You need a thumbstick guide or a tutorial on how to overclock your controller? Check out the controller playlist. Bing bong. Controller Captain out. As for the packaging with PDP's Premium Plastic Princess, a little bit of purple up top, little color pop there. You're also going to have royal blue top and bottom, and the PlayStation stamp and sigil, as this is a licensed PlayStation product. If you want to pause the box to read some of the key features, you may do so now. Now, if and when you can get your hands on this controller, it does retail for $180 on the manufacturer PDP's website, as well as third-party vendors such as Amazon. That was super climactic. A lot of buildup there is there was a lot of suction. You are gonna have a soft carrying case, very common with most premium or pro controllers. I mean, for God's sakes, if you have loose accessories like swappable thumbsticks, a carrying case is almost a staple or else you're just gonna lose shit. This is plastic. I know it looks really cool. Like maybe it's foam or something. It's just plastic. Looks cool though. And this plastic mold does not come out of the box. I'm sure you could remove it somehow, but it's not meant to just pop out. We are gonna touch on this in more detail later in the video, but this does come with a two year limited manufacturer warranty. Like to see that. Don't love to see that, but I do like to see that. Again, whole section for it later. Now, this is not officially an instruction manual, pamphlet, or brochure. This piece of documentation has a QR code, which is a really cool looking QR code, which you can scan, by the way, if you pause the screen right now, and that will take you to the manufacturer's digital or software instruction manual for the BFG, or by freaking golly, it took a long time to get this gamepad. I'm all about saving trees and minimizing documentation, but maybe one hard card kind of looks like a little postcard, like, hey, you know, greetings from Montana, but really it shows you the nitty gritty features that people are gonna need to know about these controllers. When you scan that QR code, it actually isn't going to take you to the instruction manual. It's going to take you to the landing page, the product listing for the product. You're going to have to scroll down here to product guide and then download the product guide. And when you do, it's somewhat legible on PC. Let's make the text substantially bigger, but it's pretty much unusable on your cell phone. Yes, you can pinch and read that text, but this is not a convenient delivery method for an instruction manual, especially with a somewhat complicated controller that has things like swappable modules. Let's just uh, the one, one little hard card in there, please. Physical piece of documentation. Now the carrying case is a soft cloth material, but it's not gonna provide that much protection. I mean, you want an example? I can push down on the thumbsticks, clicking down R3. Something like, just give me a second. Uh, the hard clamshell carrying case that comes with the DualSense Edge, if you haven't caught that review, it is a humdinger. Is your brother a singer? Very entertaining review and definitely the most comprehensive in-depth review you will find. Definitely recommend it. A little bit biased because it is my video and I put a lot of time into her, but hey, the people have spoken and they like it too. This is a hard carrying case. There's no flex or give. This is... Plastico, plastic. And if you're a betting man or woman, you can put your money down on the table that there's gonna be a side by side by side comparison between the Razer Wolverine V2 Pro, the BFG, by freaking goodness, it's here finally, and the DualSense Edge. Why those three controllers? Well, because they were all released back to back to back. They're all premium or pro controllers for PS5 and they're all similarly priced and have similar features. And it's what all the cool kids are talking about right now. So I'd be a damn buffoon to not cover the topic. I'm the controller captain for God's sake. Reporting for duty, it's kind of my, my thing to really give those controllers the business. Now the carrying case does look cosmetically nice. You have a little bit of purple trim around the outside of the zipper. This is a metal pull tab and then you have this cloth hook here. So if you wanted to hang it from something, you know, wring her out to dry, you can do that because your gameplay was so wet. <laughs> Thanks to this controller. Good. You'll love to see that. You already know what I'm going to say if you're a longtime viewer of the channel. The included USB-C cable is making clearance with both of the thumbsticks. A lot of times with these included carrying cases with very expensive pro controllers, mind you, when you close them, it puts the cable directly over the 
the thumbsticks to where they're cocked out at a weird angle, which could speed up the problem of developing stick drift. These are just potentiometer thumbsticks for God's sake. And these are not swappable like the DualSense Edge, which I find absolutely insane. PDP is not selling replacement modules for this $180 Pro controller on their website. So if this controller shits out, I'm assuming if you're in the two year spec of warranty, they'll send you just replacement modules if your problem is stick drift rather than sending you out a whole new unit, a whole new controller. But it is truly baffling to me. And I do believe down the road PDP will offer, I don't know how much it's going to cost, maybe 30, 40 bucks, but the left and right side modules. So if you get stick drift or if your fight pad breaks or something, you can get replacement parts because currently there is none for this controller, which is so weird because it is a modular controller. And I do believe that's one of the main points of having a swappable modular controller is to be able to replace parts when they fail. And that's not really a thing right now. Now I was tugging the ever living heck out of this cable and I was wondering why she just wasn't coming to me. Seriously, how do I get this out of here? My fingers hurt. That was Velcroed in there ridiculously tight. And the crease where the two pieces of Velcro were met together was like all the way in the back. It was really hard to get this out. Anywho, how do you do? This is a 10 foot USB-C cable, purple to fit the theme color of PDP. A couple things I do like and a couple things I don't like. I like the length at 10 foot. What I don't like is the fact that there's no included Velcro tie back. You've just got this little throwaway tie. That's not a big deal, but I hate these plastic haunches that look like a little Tootsie Roll. They serve no purpose and make cable management under desk kind of a bitch. The USB-A and C end don't have any kind of dust covers. Not a big deal, but just worth noting. And this is not very lightweight or flexible. So if you are playing dedicated wired to the PC, I would recommend going with some kind of an aftermarket lightweight flexible cable. Underneath the controller, you are going to have a little Victrix tool. You are going to have your fight pad, which is pretty sick. We're going to talk about that later. This is a removable deck, this little foam piece, and this will come out with some of your accessories, the fight pad included. And I do love how precise this foam is cut for all the accessories. It holds them in very snug. In fact, a little bit too snug. There's no cutouts to get your fingernails in there. So it's kind of difficult to get your accessories in and out. You do have some optional octagonal thumbstick gates, which is pretty much only going to be used for fighting games or retro platformers. But for any other genre of game, you're going to want to have full control of the analog sticks where your thumbstick gates are an actual circle and not guiding you into eight distinct steps like these hexagons over here. Nope, not a hexagon octagon. Go back to school, Kevin. What I said earlier, it's kind of difficult to get these damn accessories out, but you do have your dongle, little 2.4 gigahertz joint. As it says, Pro BFG dongle for PS5. You can plug this into the USB-A port on the front of your PS5. I'm going to go ahead and remove this plastic cover from the fight pad, so you better get ready for it. Then you're going to have your Victrix tool, purple, of course, branded. And this is what the tip looks like, because that's what you're interested in. I'm going to bring you overhead for a little bird's eye view. You don't need to get in a hot air balloon or anything. I'm just going to adjust the camera. But again, stupid fucking design, not having a cutout for your fingers to be able to remove the accessories. All the included accessories minus the USB-C cable are laid out in front of me, and I'm going to show you how to swap these modules because that is by far one of the most unique features of this controller. You are going to take your Victrix swap tool and apply it to these two screws. Well, four technically, I guess two on each side. But if you just want to swap the D-pad or the thumbstick caps, that's just held on by friction. Bam. Bam. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am. So if you don't like this very uniquely shaped D-pad, you can go with a more typical four-way or even a hybrid wheel. I'm going to put the wheel on. Oh, I like that. Actually extends it up. It's nice. What's not nice is the included thumbstick cap options. You do have two short concaved and the rubber silicone compound that they used is relatively comfortable. However, I do feel like this is going to break down pretty quickly as it is freakishly squishy or soft, which generally isn't a good thing for long-term durability. That's kind of confirmed by the fact that I gouged into this dome thumbstick by applying not very much pressure with my fingernails. I mean, for God's sake, that was the only way for me to get it out of the carrying case. Now that short dome is going on the left and for the right analog stick, I'm going to go with the sniper stick. That is what PDP decided to brand this thing as, which is their highest option. And I'm simply not a fan because it is freakishly narrow, very similar to the Elite Series 2's highest option, also very narrow, but I've actually gotten comfortable and pretty proficient with that Elite Series 2 stick. This one just irks me the wrong way. And I think it's because of this ribbed section on the outside. It does not provide much grip at all. That in combination with the surface area being very flat and not very grippy. I'm just not a tremendous fan. I do like the additional height though for that nice precise fire night aiming. I like it, but swapping the modules is pretty simple. I'm going to go ahead and remove the thumbsticks and the D-pad. 
take my swap tool loosening up these four screws and the modules just simply lift out. Then you're gonna have these two base plates, which I honestly can't tell if this is metal or just very durable, dense plastic. I think it's the latter, it's plastic. But if you wanna swap your thumbstick gates from these circular options to the octagons, this is your opportunity to pop them out. But now the cool thing is if you prefer the offset stick layout like an Xbox controller, or you prefer the symmetrical sticks of a PlayStation controller, you have those options here. But on the right side, you have what's called the fight pad, which I think is a really cool option for, well, just that, fighting games. You have a little beat em up pad over here, which has nice tactile clicky buttons. Yeah, you could just molly wop some combos with that. Also, if you're hearing that rattling around, it's not the buttons or anything like that. It's these screws. They actually stay in place and won't fall out, which I love. But I didn't want you to think it's these face buttons that are wiggly and making that rattly noise. I'll shit on this controller enough if it has any quality control issues. I don't want to give it undue poopage, you know? Cool, let me configure this thing how I want her. Pro tip or bro tip, if you will. When you're installing these modules, you're going to go back and forth and not a crisscross applesauce pattern because there's not four of them. There's only two, but you are going to go back and forth and you will notice that they do tighten up more and more snug as you go back and forth. So don't jack one down and then move on to the other. Start snug on one side and then go back and forth until it evenly distributes pressure on these modules to make sure you make good contact. As for cosmetics or appearance, the Pro BFG looks like it could have been such a menacing badass motherfucker, but it actually looks wildly cheap, especially in person with this light flimsy porous plastic. Let me get you a close up so you can see what I'm talking about. I might even bust out the macro lens for you. Probably not. And then you have all these different patterns. You have this stuff over here, which is just plastic by the way. This this isn't rubber or anything. And then you've got two different types of hand grips. You've got this little pad or section right here. And then you've got this pad or section back here for the rear grips with this little center section being hard plastic. And then you've got these glossy buttons and squares just ever so slightly cocked off angle or not centered. And then of course they had to squeeze a little TM in there for trademarked. Then a third style of pattern on the triggers and bumpers. Luckily that is extended or continued to these rear buttons as well. We're not in the build quality section yet. So I'm not going to talk about how this controller feels because that's a mixed sack and I guess appearances as well. It could look so badass, but it just simply doesn't. Also uneven panel gaps or seams where the front face plate and rear shell meet. I do like the purple bases of the thumbsticks. I think that adds a nice little color pop. And again, this could be such a great looking controller from pictures and online videos. It looks great. And then when you look at it in person, the overall package will leave you flaccid because all of the surface materials that you see are a different material, a different pattern. It doesn't blend together well. And I really don't want to get ahead of myself with the build quality section, but I do have some comments. Manufacturers weight and dimensions of the Pro BFG are popping up on screen. That's awesome if you like reading numbers, but as far as the actual ergonomics or comfort, the real world comfort when you wrap the gamer mitts on this bad boy, it actually feels very good. Contradictory to the build quality section where I'm gonna bash this controller up and down the block. Rightfully so, it deserves it. But as far as actual comfort, the shell design is almost identical to an Xbox One or Series controller, which is a good thing. I think those are very comfortable controllers. I also think that the PS5 DualSense is a very comfortable controller as well. And with this controller, you can mix those two worlds together because you have the shell shape or design of an Xbox controller, but then you can go symmetrical sticks like a PS4 or 5 controller or any PlayStation controller for that matter, back to the original PlayStation. And although the two rubberized pads, the ones on the front and the ones on the back are visually a different texture and shape and design, they actually feel very good and do add to the comfort factor substantially. They're soft, supple, and because of that pattern that's etched on there instead of them just being smooth rubber, that helps your hands not get hot and sweaty in long gameplay sessions, at least in my experience. Personally, I don't think comfort can get any higher than this controller, and that comes down to a couple of factors. You have the shape or shell of an Xbox controller, which is freakishly comfortable. Plus, you can go symmetrical stick layout like a PlayStation controller. So you're blending those two worlds together. Rubberized grips feel great, and then you get to these four rear buttons, which are damn near flush with the rear shell and don't cut into comfort negatively at all. They feel great. Five out of five. Perfect score. Oh, yes. The build quality or lack of quality. Just like the Victrix Gambit, the $100 wired Xbox controller, which I have reviewed on the channel, the material the PDP went with with this Pro BFG or anything but professional or pro. Build quality is simply something that is going to be lost through picture or even this video review, but it just feels like this controller could absolutely snap in my hands at any time. You want to hear a nice satisfying sound? I'm going to apply a little pressure to the chassis to test that structural rigidity, if you will.
<laughs> All the plastics feel incredibly cheap, light, and flimsy. This 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is, uh, boy, I hope she laughs. I really do. Although I'm seeing a lot less gamers still take the wired headset route. A lot of people are running dongles plugged into their console, but things like these panel gaps, the multiple types of plastics and rubbers use, and also a ton of extra play in the triggers, and that might be because of the clutch mechanism that they use that gives you five ways of adjustment, which I'm going to rave about later. I do like them, but that makes the triggers very loose and wiggly, and they also have a very cheap plasticky sound. That sound reminds me of a memory from my childhood. I was five years old. I was on aisle three of Toys R Us. I was with my great grandmother and I picked up a toy off the shelf. It was a red and green dinosaur with a robotic helmet and it felt like a cheap piece of shit just like this controller. I am going to give the controller a one out of five for build quality. That is technically the lowest possible score. I mean, I guess I could just make up the rules as we go and give it a zero or a 0.7 or some random BS like that. But I have a system here and following the scientific method, a one is the lowest possible score here. However, PDP is rocking a two year warranty as opposed to a six month or one year warranty, which a lot of the competitors rock. I like to see that. As for the direction buttons on the BFG, you do have three included D-pads. We're going to start with the four-way D-pad. When you are swapping these, you want to press them down firmly until you hear a nice satisfying click or else you are not properly seated and your D-pad will be much more loose and wiggly than it should be. We're going to start with the four-way D-pad. It does have visual markings for up and down, and that is because by holding down a function button in combination with up and down, you do have control of that 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. So your volume as well as your your game chat blend. Other than the plastics that make contact with your hand feeling like complete and utter crap, there is a good resistance to the D-pad. It is a membrane mechanism, so there's a rubber plunger underneath this front shell. No complaints there. That is a very common design. However, I do think the four-point D-pad is the most traditional, where if you have issues with either the hybrid wheel or this very unique Victrix dish, I'm going to call it that, you can just revert to something a little bit more missionary position that you're used to and you know how to get down with. To remove or swap these three dishes or options, get a fingernail up underneath there and just pull, just pull the ever living shit out of it. The hardest one to remove is by far the four point D-pad, the one that I have in there. Might have to get my little, my tool out. <sighs> which I had right here for ease of use. Now it all comes down to personal preference, but out of the three included D-pads, I actually preferred the Victrix dish, as I called it earlier. The hybrid dish had a lot of potential, but it just fell short because of the surface area. The plastic is incredibly slippery, slick. And also I thought this being raised several millimeters from the front shell would be nice, but it ended up being an inconvenience, a bit of a pain in the tuckus. I didn't enjoy this option at all. But the fact that you do have three options and you do have control of your headphone jack from the D-pad, I'm gonna give it a four out of five. Repeat, a four out of five. As for the face or action buttons, and this is where we're gonna talk about the infamous, or I don't know if it's infamous yet, this controller just came out, but the damn fight pad. It makes me aerodynamic when I fight. The fight pad is absolutely awesome. You do have six buttons, which are very large, flat, and as the name implies, this is gonna be for fighting games, so you can smash off those combos and give you that arcade-like experience. I will say these feel fantastic. They're very quick to actuate, you get a nice tactile click letting you know that you have actuated the switches instant bounce back or rebound kind of wish the other face buttons followed suit mm. now unlike the fight pad which has very large flat mechanical buttons big fan of these. As for the typical four action buttons, I am not a tremendous fan, not only cosmetically with this gloss, but will collect fingerprints and eventually micro scratches. They just don't have the most satisfying feel to actuate these switches, and that could come down to them being a membrane switch, but that's what most controllers use, and they don't feel like this. So these action buttons or face buttons are serviceable. They'll get you through gameplay. Granted, you're probably not going to be using them as much as you used to on that standard controller, because you can rebond them to these rear buttons, baby, but <sighs> they're really nothing to write home about. Not a huge fan of how small and close spaced out they are. Three out of five. I'm not going to smack them around or anything, but I'm not going to take them out to dinner. Three out of five. As for the accessory button, so that is going to be the touchpad and all these extra giblets over here being the pause and share button and the tournament lock button. It doesn't have the worst swivel point in the world where it's at like a weird hinge in the middle, but it also doesn't feel very satisfying to press. And all of these buttons feel like absolute parts been crap. They're just... I, I absolutely hate all these buttons here. The placement is okay and they are far enough from the front shell to where I can easily hit them to pause my game and share a clip, but they don't feel great. I don't like the surface material they went with. It looks like it'd be rubberized. It's not, it's cheap ass plastic. And this pattern doesn't match up with this pattern or this pattern or this pattern. It's just all very not well blended together but they feel decent accessory button sweet three out of five, three out of five. Nose for the thumbsticks, joysticks, or as PlayStation likes to call them analog sticks. We're gonna start this section of the review right here and then we're gonna take it to project zero for a little bit of technical analysis. 
I'm not a huge fan of the included thumbstick caps. There's only four as opposed to most other pro controllers that come with six or even eight. And not just quantity, but also quality with this rubber or silicone compound not really hitting the best of either world. Meaning it's not the most grippy silicone compound in the world where you just barely brush your finger around and it's like grip tape. It's suction to it, right? Ferrari tires. But it's also such a soft, squishy, supple rubber, which generally provide a ton of grip, but wear out quicker, break down, start falling apart. So I do predict, at least with the dome stick, that this is going to break down incredibly quickly, but not provide dope amounts of grip either. Also, the sniper stick, talked about it during the included accessory section, but narrow. This rib section around the outside doesn't really do much of anything. Moving on from that, it doesn't seem like you're getting very much travel from these thumbstick gates because of these large outer bumpers, these thumbstick gate rings. However, I do believe that is just the placebo effect, and I do think you're getting full travel with these thumbsticks. I just don't like the way they feel, and feel is a big factor when you're playing with a controller. I mean, that's the interface between your console or computer and you, the gamer. It's the most important thing. It's what's controlling your game. Fucking important. Over here in my comrade, me amigo, my gamepad tester, we are recognized as an Xbox 360 controller. That's about par for the course. And she's looking tight, real taut like, with axes one through three being the vertical and horizontal axes on the left and right analog stick, being perfectly calibrated at 0.00002 right out of the box. Meaning, well, tight dead zones as I barely put my fingers on the thumbsticks, they start registering movement. That's good, tight dead zones. And also, no out of the box stick drift, at least not indicated here in Gamepad Tester. Now let's test the circularity to get the out-of-the-box accuracy. Is there any areas where your inputs simply are not being properly registered? Not on the right stick, how about the left? Let's go counterclockwise. That's what she's been asking for. Substantially worse on the left analog stick, but could be a fluke. We're going to run a couple more and average the results. Okay, slow and steady wins the race. Left stick isn't going to be winning any races. So after four tests, these are the results that I'm getting. They're quite consistent with four back-to-back -back pulls. As you can see, the left analog stick is a little bit wonky on the top right, meaning some of your inputs might might not be properly registered, but don't fret too much because an average error of 10 to 15% is common with potentiometer thumbstick modules, and they'll play fine, and you wouldn't even know that there's anything wrong with them unless you threw them in gamepad tester. Due to everything I said on the desk over my shoulder when I was hands-on stick time with the thumbsticks, and now the technical analysis, these thumbsticks get a 2.5 out of 5 from Gamer Heaven. Now as for the triggers and bumpers, they do have the same plastic design. This isn't rubberized or anything, and this doesn't provide any grip whatsoever. It does look like it would be etching or stippling to give you a little grip. It's like a damn oil slick up here, but it does look cool. As for the bumpers, they have a nice tactile click. I do believe these are mechanical switches, or if not, they're like no membranes, which I've ever felt or heard. They feel great. They're also on a swivel mechanism, but you can actuate them up here or on the sides. So no complaints with these bumpers. Great ergonomic position. Five out of five for these bad boys. As for the triggers, I am a big fan because they are the clutch system, similar or identical, I should say, to what is on the Victrix Gambit for Xbox. And these are five-way adjustable switches. By default, they are turned off, so you have a full linear squeeze if you want to modulate the throttle and brake in a racing game or something, but then you start playing a shooter and you want to cut out as much of your trigger pull as possible. So to get the very shortest pull, so setting five of five, the shortest stop or lock possible, without touching the triggers whatsoever, you are gonna pull the clutch button. And you heard a nice little tactile click, and now that is the entirety of your trigger pull right there. I don't know exactly how many millimeters that is, but it's short. It is Paquito. To set it to a custom mount, you're gonna hold the clutch button and then squeeze the trigger to your desired amount. So let's say about halfway, which will be step three of five, and then release the clutch button. And now, you stop at that halfway mark. Now to fully disengage it, you are gonna hold the clutch button, squeeze down the trigger, release the clutch button, and now, it is disengaged and you have that full trigger squeeze again. These are awesome other than one aspect and that is going to be there is a lot of play or wiggle side by side which comes down to build quality and also they are very slippery and the plastics that they went with look and feel like crap. That literally sounds like a toy. This is a $180 toy. It wasn't in the discount bundle where I like to jump into it head first and knees deep. Triggers, I'm gonna give them a four out of five. They would be an absolute five out of five because of that awesome clutch system, which I do renowned as being pretty kick-ass because of its adjustability. Five stops better than competitors that tout three. But again, all that side-by-side -side wiggle and halfling to listen to this every time you squeeze the trigger. A four out of five for me. Now, unlike the Vitrix, which had two removable options, a two button and a four button, neither of which I was a huge fan of because both of which felt incredibly cheap and flimsy, probably because of the fact that they're removable. I mean, for God's sake, I could break this thing on camera so easily right now. I'm not going to because I actually use this controller sometimes. There was no structural integrity there. 
fucking hole of the Titanic over there. One bad review from our YouTuber, one iceberg could just crumple it. The Pro BFG has a much better design in my opinion, having four permanently affixed rear buttons, which are very ergonomically comfortable. Where you wanna naturally wrap your fingers around the palm grips, they're gonna sit with your middle fingers on the top buttons and your ring fingers on the bottom buttons. They're almost completely flush with the rear shell, which is fantastic because it doesn't cut into comfort at all. Also, they do require enough resistance to where you're not gonna accidentally actuate them. And I like everything about these except the sound. They have a bit of a hollow plasticky sound that isn't very confidence inducing. But other than that, these feel fantastic. I don't feel like they're gonna snap off. It'd be very hard to break them actually because they're not paddles. They're buttons sunken in with the rear shell. You'd have to do something really uniquely stupid to break these. Now it's too early to make this claim or sentiment right now because this is a big, bold statement. But I will say as of now, this is probably one of my favorite rear button designs for PS5. And keep in mind, I have access to all of them shits. Now the next thing I just want to praise PDP for is how easy it is to remap or rebind these rear buttons. I have recently been slapping around controllers during reviews because you either cannot remap or rebind them on the fly. You have to have a software program that sometimes requires a PC, which some people don't own. But taking it a step further, a couple I reviewed recently that you could rebind or refly. Refly? Rebind on the fly. Refly because we haven't made up a word in a while. You want to rebind your buttons on the fly? Refly them. Along with lowering your delag through overclocking. The onboard board that allows you to remap is probably one of the most convenient and fastest that I have ever tested. You do have three profiles that you can swap through. Pressing the profile button once will indicate which profile you're in. Pressing it again will allow you to swap through the profiles. And when you're ready to remap, it is instantaneous. Select the profile you want. So I'm gonna select this blue profile over here. Hold down the profile button and a rear button you wanna rebind. So this bottom right my right, your left. And you only need to hold them down for like a second, bam. Now that button's flashing as well as the status indicator in the front letting me know I'm in remapping mode and I'm gonna bind that to cross. Let's do the same thing for this button, bam, circle. Three rapid flashes let you know it has bound successfully. And it's just that quick, meaning I can rebind all four of the buttons in under 10 seconds. I'm not gonna time myself, but it's pretty damn fast. We've got two more buttons to do. Look how fast that is. Bam, square. So it's just really fast to rapidly rattle them off. It doesn't stay in remapping mode, but it's so quick to enter it. You just need to hold down a rear button and remapping mode for like, you don't even really need to hold it down. I do believe it's just the combination of pressing the profile button with the rear button that lets it know, hey, boom, put me in remapping mode. Now, if you want to erase one of your remappings and have the button go back to being blank or not used at all. It's going to be a similar process. You are going to hold that profile button and a rear button and then press the rear button again. And it will flash three times letting you know that you have cleared that binding. And that's that folder on my computer titled controllers because you know behind closed doors I like to overclock my controllers and I don't stop till they're pinned out at a thousand hertz and having connectivity issues. In this folder we're going to launch X input test which is going to measure our refresh rate or polling rate. Those two words are used interchangeably. And that is going to give us our out of the box input lag or delay which is looking about 8 milliseconds, but it is consistent at 8 milliseconds. That's probably because we're at 125 hertz stock clock. My god, you called it. It's almost as if you've done this once or twice. In all seriousness, this is a very consistent connection, which I could tell even before I was able to see the minimum and maximum numbers, because as I was rotating my hand on the left analog stick, all I was seeing was 7.8s and a couple of 8s. All the numbers were very similar, meaning very consistent. Very minimal judder, but we are clearly at 125 hertz stock polling rate, which is going to give us 8 milliseconds of input lag or delay, on PC at least when you're going wired. This is a PlayStation licensed controller, so in essence, since it is PlayStation board based, it should not be polling rate locked Xbox controllers are. I do still recommend overclocking them. If you're curious why, watch my overclocking guide. But one thing I thought was very interesting is we're getting eight milliseconds of stock input lag or delay as we're PS4 and 5 controllers run a 250 hertz clock and generally have about four milliseconds of stock delay. So I'm going to give stock input lag or delay a two out of five as it is subpar or worse than virtually all other PlayStation controllers I have tested. Not all, but like 90% of them. 2.5. Let's overclock. Over here in the Lord of Mice overclocking program, make this window a little bit bigger, expand the child names and our controller is bam right there hid compliant game controller just to confirm that i'm gonna unplug it it is gonna disappear on me replug it she realized the dating scene ain't shit and she's gonna return sick she came back real quick these controllers can't stay away from the captain for long they might try and escape the gamer heaven but they always trickle on back to the old gamepad wall let me tell you sister this controller is not overclocked which is giving us about four to eight milliseconds of input lag or delay we're on the ass end of that with eight milliseconds as it is on the default clock which we're gonna remedy right here right now default that's cool if you like 
like to leave things stock. 1000, please install service. Filter on device, install service. You open. Unplugging a stock controller to never see her again. Replugging a modified beast. Reflecting an overclock at 1000 hertz for an estimated one millisecond of input lag or delay. We'll see if that's the way the cookie crumbles, dunk your milk. And the cookie crumbled identically as this controller is pulling rate locked, at least with this wired method. I'm also going to plug in that dongle and attempt to overclock it wirelessly via that method. But first, let's measure the stock input lag or delay with the dongle. That's what you're going to be using on your PS5. Granted, the input lag or delay will be slightly different on PC, but we kind of know what that dongle is doing with its life. To use this controller wirelessly on PC, you are going to use the included dongle and plug that into your PC. I plugged into one of the USB ports on the front of my tower. They are 3.0s. You're not going to have any performance benefit by using a 3.0 versus a 2.0, but you're also not going to have any adverse effects with this dongle. I did test it. You're getting identical results here. And then you're going to flip the rear slider to the wireless icon, and then the slider on the top of the controller, switch that to PC. Then hold down the PlayStation button for about three seconds to power the controller on. You will hear a little chime or chirp as Windows recognizes your new controller. And it's automatically up and running an X input test with that wireless dongle, which is fantastic. It looked sporadic as hell, which we see from the minimum and maximum being pretty far from each other, but it's still identical at eight milliseconds. Actually, it's a little bit lower than the wired connection as we're getting 7.8 milliseconds versus the eight we were getting. But it is an identical clock at 125 hertz by taking the wireless method. I'm gonna run a couple more. So another poll just to confirm that we are at 7.88 milliseconds at 125 hertz clock wirelessly. So there is no speed benefit on PC to going wired whatsoever. So your only benefit there is just not worrying about battery life. Let's try and overclock the diggity dongle to see if we can get wireless performance faster. Probably not, but I'm doing my due diligence right now. Now we are down here as an HID compliant game controller, four to eight milliseconds of lag. Just to confirm that, I'm gonna turn the controller off and then turn it back on. Took a second, but it did disappear on me. Turn it back on. I'm just sitting here like an idiot. Forgot you gotta hold down the PlayStation button to turn it on. Cool, there it is again. Let's attempt to overclock it via this method. I don't think it's going to be any different, but we're going to try. No benefit whatsoever, so you cannot overclock this controller with a wired or wireless method. I'm going to give overclock performance... Uh, I'm going to give overclock performance an NA for non-applicable because it's pulling rate locked, man. Now, as opposed to a 1560 milliamp hour battery, which a stock PS5 DualSense controller comes with, I expected battery life to be a little bit longer than 20 hours because this controller not only doesn't have haptic feedback motors, but no vibration or rumble force motors, period, which generally drain a good portion of battery life. In addition to this, there is no motors for adaptive triggers, so you are losing out on that functionality. I do have an entire video linked in the description below as to why this is somewhat detrimental if you are going to be using controllers like this on PS5 to play PS5 exclusive games. However, if you're playing PS4 games on your PS5, they're not even going to take advantage of adaptive triggers or haptics, so that's not a big deal. Or if you're using this for PC, or if you just don't give a damn because you're playing games that you would disable vibration or adaptive triggers for anyway, for example, competitive first-person shooters, then having no vibration functionality and missing out on the adaptive trigger feature is not a big deal whatsoever. And in fact, can save weight. Doesn't in this case, as this is still a pretty hefty controller. Probably that 2000 milliamp hour battery, which in my opinion should get it more than 20 hours of battery life, but that is what's advertised. And the community experience from people that actually have had hands on time with this gamepad is about 18 to 20 hours. So that's on par with what is claimed from PDP. I mentioned that tournament lock mode, which I think is a very interesting feature that I don't recall seeing on any other controllers. What this does, you're going to enable the feature by holding down the function button and profile button simultaneously. It will throw you into a tournament lock mode, which will disable the PlayStation create and options and touchpad button for that matter, which apparently according to PDP would disqualify you from tournaments. I don't know what league they're referring to, uh, but yeah, if you accidentally brush against your touchpad and you get thrown out of your local esports tournament, then that will never happen to you ever again because you've got tournament lock mode. This controller does have a piece of software. Is it a piece of shit or is it a piece of ass? We're going to find out. It's called Victrix Control Hub, which will take you to, you guessed it, the Microsoft Store. An average of 3.8 stars from 14 mediocrely happy customers. Now I'm using my own aftermarket cable. It's BYOC or bring your own cable day here at Gamer Heaven. So this is 10 foot, lightweight, flexible. It's a good boy. Toggle of the back of the controller in wired mode. Toggle on the top of the controller in PC mode. Plugging into the USB-C port on the top of the controller. Windows made a noise. Now I keep getting this message, which is pretty interesting because I'm absolutely meticulous with my PC drivers is in I have a third party program that goes through and scrubs and makes sure I don't have duplicates, have conflicting drivers, shit like that. PC gamer life. Sweet. So I did a little research. I do not believe the software program is actually up and running for this controller yet. Considering this program, Victrix Control Hub is the identical application that I used in the review of the Victrix Gambit. I will link that review in the description below. So if you'd like to see what the software looks like, it is identical, but it doesn't currently work, at least from everything that I've seen, heard, read, and experienced as you saw with my own controller. And that's kind of even confirmed here. It says app update coming soon. The B 
BFG is fully customizable and mappable out of the box, meaning directly on the controller itself on the fly. But those 14 reviews on the Microsoft Store were from users of the Victrix Gambit, not the BFG Wireless, which currently doesn't have the app support, but it looks like Victrix Control Hub in the near future will be the application suite that you use to control things like your trigger dead zones, thumbstick sensitivity curves, stuff like that. But you don't really need that considering the most important thing is going to be remapping the rear buttons and you can do that on the fly very quickly. So as for the con shortcomings or areas of improvement, the plastics, basically all the build materials feel like shit. I thought about busting out the old thesaurus and getting articulate with explaining why it feels like it just feels like shit. It feels like build cost was probably around $50. It's branded as being a pro controller and sold for $180. That's what the tarot cards are telling me. That's what the build quality here is telling me. Thought Toys R Us went out of business? I don't know. Sounds like they're out there making controllers. Oh! Uh, in all seriousness, the build quality feels terrible, which is weird because that doesn't fall in line with comfort, which is very good due to those rubber grips, good positioning of the triggers and bumpers, good shape, and great rear buttons. Comfort's there, it's just all the plastics you use make me think that this is going to just blow up in my hand one day. But if it does, two-year warranty, that's a pro. That's in the pro section. Next con, all the included thumbstick options are pretty garbage. There's only four of them as opposed to six or eight with the competitors include. And like I mentioned, the silicone compound doesn't do either good durability or good grip. It just feels like it's in the dead center of not doing either good. Also, the unboxing process is a little bit frustrating because the laser cut foam holds all your components super tight and there is no cutouts for your fingers to get them out without potentially damaging shit. Next up, I fully understand that this controller wasn't gonna have adaptive triggers. I knew that going into this controller considering it's not a licensed dual since controller, it's a completely different third-party variant, and I'm cool with it not having the haptic feedback motors. However, I would like if it had vibration, period, of any kind. Even the last generation Rumble Force motors, just so we had vibration in the controller, period. That'd be kind of cool. You could deactivate it in the settings if you didn't like it. The people that want it, it'd be on there if this has no vibration. You're losing functionality of a stock controller. The last con, this controller isn't readily available. It is labeled as sold out on their website, and virtually every third-party vendor that you might be able to get it at, such as Amazon, is listed as sold out, and even if you do order it, you're going to get a bunch of email delays. I've been waiting on this controller for about two and a half months. I was actually in the first round of pre-orders too. So yeah. As for the pros, this is a very comfortable controller. Despite having two different shapes and sizes and types of rubber, they actually feel very good. The rubberized grips. The shell, also very comfortable. The trigger stops with that five-way clutch system is really cool. I like it a lot. This controller has literally the best system for rebinding the rear buttons. It is so fast. You can rebind all four of the rear buttons in under 10 seconds. Probably like five seconds if you're on meth or something. Next up, two-year warranty. It's kind of crazy that I'm listing that as a pro, but it is better than the six months or one year that a lot of its competitors is offering. It are offering? Grammar is off. They continue to offer on the daily. The biggest pro, in my opinion, is going to be the rear buttons. They are an absolute joy. I lauded them during the rear button section. You can go back there if you want to hear why they're so damn good. These rear buttons are an absolute ergonomic joy. I love them. So the verdict. This is a controller I will be playing PS4 games on PS5 and I will be using on PC. However, I'm probably not going to pick it up much for PS5 specific games on account of it not having adaptive triggers, haptic feedback, or an internal speaker. Three features that come together to add to immersion of PS5 exclusives, SIE, Sony Interactive Entertainment titles, that really do just that immersion quite well. And something to note, third-party custom controller companies that make PS5 dual senses such as Scuf, AIM, Battle Beaver, Hex, Mega Mods, etc. all start with a factory stock dual sense controller, so they're going to have the haptic feedback motors and adaptive triggers, and built-in speaker and microphone. Four features that this controller controller does not have. So four features, good features of a stock Sony controller stripped from a $180 Pro controller, which should have more additional features. Features that a lot of you might not give a shit about, but something that needs noted. It's not here. They're not present. If you are looking for a solid wireless controller, granted it does lack some of the functionality of a stock PS5 controller, but you know that already. You knew that. You watched this review. You looked at the landing page, the website. But if you're in the market for a solid four rear button PS5 DualSense with some of the best trigger locks and rear buttons in the game, Thus far, the BFG Pro is looking pretty good in my eyes. In the very near future, I am going to be doing a side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison with the Razer Wolverine V2 Pro, Pro BFG, and of course, the Sony DualSense Edge. Drop in the comment section below what you're using to play on PS5, and I'll see you stallions and stallionettes tomorrow.
Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of Gamer Heaven, join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting Gamer Heaven and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes, most of the time. Peace.